Committee will come to order. Let me um, appreciate all who are here this morning. I want to particularly thank our mayors who are joining us uh, for this hearing on the issue of our infrastructure problems in the country. We gather this morning to examine once again the condition of our nation's physical infrastructure and proposals that are needed to uh, make improvements in it. When the committee uh, last gathered to examine this critical issue, we considered the perspectives from individuals who held expertise in public and private financing, civil engineering, labor and business. They were unanimous in voicing compelling support <clears throat> for increased investment in our nation's infrastructure and for the need to develop and implement alternative ways to finance this critically important investment in our nation's future. Today we consider the local perspective on our nation's infrastructure and we'll hear from individuals who are most qualified to offer that critical perspective, our nation's mayors. We are fortunate to have before us as distinguished panel of leaders who represent cities from different regions of our nation, who hold different political affiliations and who face different challenges in their communities. But what they share in common is far more important than what differences, uh, what differentiates them. These mayors, like their colleagues across the nation, bear the lion's share of responsibility for maintaining the roads, bridges, mass transit systems, drinking water systems, wastewater removal systems and other vital components of our national structures. The Federal Highway Administration reports that out of the four million miles of roads in our nation, over three million miles are owned by counties, cities, and towns. Local governments maintain almost 60 percent of our nation's 54,000 drinking water systems and 98 percent of the 16,000 wastewater systems in the country. Our counties and cities, towns also have a frontline perspective on what happens when the needs of our infrastructures go unmet. Just got a couple of, of photographs to illustrate the point here. Obviously, we all remember last summer in August in Minneapolis, uh, the collapse that afternoon of the, of the bridge, the loss of lives, and uh, the, uh, the national attention it drew to the condition of our highway systems. And then the second uh, photograph, Mayor, you'll be familiar with this one, Mayor Bloomberg, the New York City steam pipe explosion that caused a great disruption in the city. Again, a further example of, of what's, uh, what's happened. When the bridge collapsed in Minneapolis, Mayor Ryback was among the first to respond. When the steam pipe exploded in New York City, Mayor Bloomberg was among the first to respond. And where the Meanus River Bridge collapsed in my home state of Connecticut in 1983, I know that several mayors in Fairfield County joined state officials <clears throat> in responding to that tragedy. Here in Washington, we uh, may cite alarming statistics, like the 14,000 Americans who die each year at least, in part because of crumbling roads and bridges, the over 5,500 Americans who are sickened each year, from some of the 850 billion gallons of storm water and raw sewage left untreated by obsolete wastewater systems, or the average American who wastes 1.5 hours a year, uh, if you will, in traffic uh, congestion. Excuse me, 51.5 hours a year in traffic congestion. However, our mayors see these alarming statistics as more than just numbers on a piece of paper. They witness how these statistics play out each and every day in their communities and the people who are affected by them. They personally console individuals and loved ones uh, in uh, road accidents caused by poorly engineered highways or collapsed bridges. They personally connect with individuals who are sickened by an overburdened drinking water a system or wastewater system. And uh, they experience the devastating economic effects when jobs are lost because the infrastructure in their communities cannot provide for effective movement of people, goods, and information. There is no question that the mayors are acutely aware of our nation's enormous immediate and unmet infrastructure needs. In fact, this awareness has already translated into meaningful action. I want to commend recent and comprehensive efforts undertaken by state and local governments to raise the awareness of our infrastructure needs nationwide. Efforts such as Building America's Future, which Mayor Bloomberg has undertaken with Governor Rendell and Schwarzenegger, are certainly well known to most Americans. The American Society of Engineers estimates that an investment of 1.6 trillion dollars over five years is required just to bring our current infrastructure to an acceptable level. That translates into $320 billion a year just to upgrade existing structures to serve the needs of our nation. As we face the prospect of significant long-term budget deficits, a weakening economy, decreasing tax revenues, and increasing unemployment, it is clear that the current ways by which we invest in our nation's infrastructure have become as obsolete as many of the infrastructure systems themselves. We must, I think, forge a strong partnership between federal, state, and local governments to 
to explore other creative and fiscally responsible ideas that protect Americans to keep our economy as strong as possible. We also cannot afford to delay. I believe the cost of meeting our infrastructure needs is great, but the cost of failing to meet them is even greater and will grow every day. That is why, along with my colleague uh, from Nebraska, Senator Chuck Hagel, who's here with us this morning, uh, and a variety of other people, have proposed a, creating a national infrastructure bank to help us meet these challenges. The bank would mark the first federal effort to prioritize infrastructure projects across different modes of transportation and water treatment. It would be the first federal program to rate these different infrastructure projects on the basis of merit and to invest in projects based on their merit. And by focusing on projects of regional and national significance, the bank would help us meet some of the largest challenges that we are confronted with. This proposal will not solve all of our problems, obviously, but we believe that it will go a long way to addressing many of the concerns that we've heard from our witnesses, as we will today and those who appeared uh, prior to today. And I'll continue to work, obviously, with my colleague from Alabama, Senator Shelby, and other members of this committee to find that common ground that I hope we can and will be able to move this legislation forward. My hope would be even this Congress. I do not know an exact timetable. As you know, we're very busy working on legislation to address the housing issues in our country, but I do hope that we can move a bill through this committee, possibly in a timely fashion. I appreciate, obviously, the willingness of our witnesses to share their insights with the committee today. We look forward to your testimony. I know that we have several other members who are here to introduce their, uh, some of our witnesses, and uh, before doing that, let me turn to my colleague from Alabama, the ranking member of this committee, for any opening comments he want to make, and then we'll turn to introduction of witnesses and any comments of our colleagues here. Senator Shelby. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. I just want Isaacson uh, to represent Mayor Franklin, a, a good friend, and uh, why don't I invite both of you? Where's John? There you are, right there. Two of you want to step up and uh, introduce the Mayor of Atlanta. Thanks to her leadership, we're seeing a much busier airport in Atlanta today. 
serving the needs of people all over the world, something that was not happening 10 years ago. So I'm very pleased to be, uh, to be here today to introduce you to this committee. And just to tell you that uh, you could not have a better resource than Mayor Franklin to talk to when it comes to the infrastructure needs and, most importantly, the way to fix those infrastructure needs. So it's my privilege to share with my uh, colleague, Senator Isaacson, the honor of introducing Mayor Sir Thank you very much, Senator. And Johnny, welcome to the committee. Son Charlie, she's a good old gal and a rock star, and we're mighty proud of her. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get a better endorsement than that, I think, uh, along the way. Well, thank you very much, uh, both senators from Georgia. We appreciate it very much. And our colleague from Florida, we obviously have Mel Martinez from Florida on the committee, but Bill Nelson, my good friend, uh, is also here. And why don't we start with you, Bill, and introduce the mayor of Jacksonville. Well, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to come uh, along with Mel and tell you about our mayor the mayor of the bold new city of the South, uh, the first coast of Florida, uh, a, a, a city that uh, was quite uh, visionary uh, some three decades ago when it decided to consolidate its government. And so, in essence, the city government is the county government. And there are a number of cities in Florida that are having now a recognition of that kind of charter form of government is the most efficient. And of course, uh, atop that structure sits the mayor of Jacksonville, an extremely powerful person and one who has great vision. Now, it's great that uh, Mayor Payton is here to talk about infrastructure because Jacksonville has really been quite visionary uh, in getting the infrastructure that we need. Our, our colleagues from Atlanta uh, are talking about the infrastructure of the airport, and indeed that is, and yet the Jacksonville airport, as Jacksonville was host to the Super Bowl, who ever thought about a little city being host to a Super Bowl, and yet people realized it wasn't a little city, and the city that size it was handled that Super Bowl and all of its traffic with exceptional uh, aplomb, discretion, and efficiency. And uh, so representing that here as you all talk about the desperate need that we have in this country for infrastructure. If it had been this senator's druthers, instead of that stimulus bill sending out checks this senator's preference was that we had to put that money into infrastructure. And now you all are addressing that, and I commend you for it, and I am very happy that our mayor is here to address the specifics of that legislation. Thank you very much. Thank Bill. you very much. Mel, do you want to make a word or two? And well, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I'll go ahead and join in. I uh, had some opening comments on the whole subject, but I really um, uh, appreciate John uh, Payton being here. He's a good friend and a good man and a good mayor. Uh, again, as uh, Senator Nelson indicated, uh, hosting a Super Bowl was a pinnacle, I think, of his mayoralty. But he's worked on some other things, too, that are laudable. Uh, he's uh, launched a nationally recognized uh, early uh, childhood literacy program, for which I know, uh, Mayor, you've received a lot of attention, and I think uh, deservedly so. Uh, the city of Jacksonville is one of our great cities. I'm uh, uh, always, when I, uh, uh, this mayor form of government, when I was mayor of Orlando, Orange County, in Orlando, I um, uh, quickly went to Jacksonville and met with his predecessor to see how this mega government was working. They've done a great job. I'm proud to have you here. Welcome. 
Well, thanks very much. And let me uh, uh, say to, uh, to Mayor Funkhauser and, uh, and to uh, Mayor Bloomberg, uh, it, Senator Schumer, I know would like to get by. He still may. He's not here, but let me just say how pleased we are you're here. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg, it's a, a great honor to have you before the committee. And um, 108th Mayor of New York City. It's a, a remarkable city and uh, done a remarkable job with it. And I think most people are aware of your background in private sector and then moving into the second uh, stage of your life, the public sector. So, two times been elected by the people of that city, so we're honored to have you here. And uh, uh, Mayor Frank Hauser, I know Claire McCaskill as well wanted to be by this morning and to present you to the committee, and I, she has another committee assignment this morning that she's chairing, I believe. But it's important, I think everyone know here, that the mayor of Kansas City uh, is a former auditor. He was named uh, National Public Official of the Year by Governing Magazine in 2003, holds a doctorate in public administration and sociology from the University of Missouri, and uh, is also in Washington as the lead participant in the Brookings Institute Summit for the American Prosperity, and a remarkable career and a great career. And you're honest, uh, you're, you're wonderful to be with us this morning and share some thoughts. Let me turn, if I just quickly, to Senator Hagel. He's my, been my co-author of this bill we've spent the last three years on, along with uh, people I know that Mayor Bloomberg knows, Felix Rowetton and, and Bernie Schwartz, not to mention the Center for Strategic International Studies, CSIS and a lot of good people who've spent a lot of time helping us craft this idea that we've asked you to comment on this morning. But Chuck, do you want to make any opening comments? Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I do have uh, a statement that I would ask to be included in the record. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding another hearing on this issue and, of course, to our distinguished witnesses uh, who are on the front line of governing in this country. Uh, just a couple of uh, comments, Mr. Chairman. Uh, many of you may have noted this week a column in the Washington Post by uh, Farid Zakaria uh, on the world economy and America's competitive position in the world today. And uh, I commend the article to you, and I want to just quote uh, two lines from that uh, piece. Uh, Farid uh, wrote, quote, U.S. spending on infrastructure as a percentage of GDP is the lowest in the industrialized world, end of quote. Earlier this year, uh, many of you may have noted as well, Morgan Stanley predicted that emerging economies, including countries throughout Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, will spend over $22 trillion on new infrastructure over the next 10 years. Uh, and. Uh, that Morgan Stanley report goes on in some detail about uh, the specific projects in the countries. Uh, no group of leaders in this country understands the need for infrastructure more, as we know, Mr. Chairman, than, than our mayors, and these four in particular, who have uh, uh, not, uh, unlike all bodies of government, uh, been restricted by fiscal realities, and uh, they are no different in, in some ways than we are here. Uh, representing the federal government, but yet they have come up with creative, new, dynamic, 21st century ideas on how to do this. And that's uh, as much the essence of this hearing as you and I have talked over the years, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we must find 21st century ideas, programs, systems, processes, policies to address 21st century challenges. If we uh, are not willing to do that, not only do we fail our country, the next generation of Americans and the next generation after that. Uh, but uh, we will find ourselves falling behind in a, in a very competitive world, and we can't afford to, uh, to do that. So I don't know of an issue that is more fundamental to our future, Mr. Chairman, uh, and to our nation's future uh, than this infrastructure challenge. Uh, we are, are, I believe, uh, this country uh, are uh, represented by the finest minds, most creative thinkers. Uh, our balance sheet, uh, we have some at the witness table, some here uh, around this table who uh, have been in business. Uh, balance sheets are important. America's balance sheet is more significant than any nation's balance sheet. I wouldn't trade our balance sheet for China's, for India's, any other country. But we will squander that balance sheet unless we provide some very, very insightful 21st century leadership. And those before us this morning, Mr. Chairman, have done that, are doing that in difficult times. So I am very proud to join with you, Mr. Chairman, in this effort and this committee and thank all who have been 
particularly involved, you've mentioned some of them, and, and there are others, and to uh, our distinguished witnesses, and look forward to their comments. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Mayor Bloomberg, we're honored to be here this morning, and thank you for the work you've been doing on this with, your, uh, with uh, Governor Rendell and Governor Schwarzenegger. It's uh, great to have the three of you involved in this, and we're honored you're here this morning, and we thank you for all the work you've been doing as well. The floor is yours. Mitty wanted to make sure I said hello, so I said hello, uh, but uh, keep up the good work. Uh, I am the mayor of New York City. I'm also co-chair, as uh, Senator uh, Dodd said, of Building America's Future, a coalition of state and local officials that we founded along with uh, Governor Rendell and Governor Schwarzenegger this past January. And the reason that we came together is really very simple. We're facing an infrastructure crisis in this country that threatens our status as an economic superpower and threatens the health and the safety of the people that we serve. As you know, infrastructure is not a sexy or glamorous topic, but it is one of the most pressing issues facing our country today. And that is why in good economic times and in bad ones, uh, we in New York have made infrastructure a top priority. Uh, attached to my testimony today is a summary list of the projects that we're currently working on, but let me just point out a few. Uh, we in the city of New York, with city taxpayer dollars, have invested $2 billion in a new subway extension to open up the far west side of Manhattan, uh, $6 billion in a water tunnel so that we can have a critical backup supply of water for our city, and $6 billion on upgrades to our surge treatment plants. Nobody wants to spend money on infrastructure, particularly in difficult times when we don't have enough money to do everything else we have to do. But this is our future, this is our legacy, and we're not going to walk away from it. Across the city, in addition to this, we're spending tens of billions of dollars, other things, improvements and extensions. Uh, that, but the truth of the matter is that is certainly not enough. New York City and the region need something like $30 billion just in the next five years to continue to bring our mass transit system up to the state of good repair and to expand its capacity to meet growing demand. We need $23 uh, billion other dollars uh, to the same for our drinking water and our sewerage system. And we're not unique in this regard. According to the American Society of Civil Engineers, the entire country needs to invest at least $1.6 trillion over the next five years to maintain and expand our roads and bridges, bring our rail network up to a state of good repair, and construct critical water and wastewater projects. $1.6 trillion is obviously a staggering amount of money, but it's also staggering how little the federal government is doing to help cities and states address these challenges. Uh, Senator, I think you pointed out uh, it isn't always easy. Uh, to do this, but during the Great Depression, uh, you should remember that New Deal did provide economic stimulus in the form of jobs to build infrastructure. LaGuardia Airport, which I'm sure a lot of you have flown in and out of, was a New Deal project, as was the electrification of the New York-Washington rail line. These projects created jobs, but they also created a lasting infrastructure that still serves our country. And then after World War II, Congress saw the need to tie the nation together with a highway network, and together with President Eisenhower, they made the, that network a national priority and funded 90% of its total cost. Think about it this way. You had a Democratic and a Republican president instituting a stimulus package and a jobs creation program. Yes, they did both. But most importantly for our country, they invested in our future, not short-term, politically popular giveaways with dubious economic impact. Decades of growth came from the institutions and the initiatives that they started 70 and 50 years ago. And lately, sadly, we have looked for ways to avoid short-term uh, investments that give us long-term benefits. In the 1960s and 1970s, in all fairness, the federal government did take the lead in funding transit projects around the nation, including Washington's metro system. But the decades that followed did see less and less leadership from Washington, less and less willingness to open its purse strings. Now, I'm as happy as any other mayor to get federal or state funding. But I will say uh, the New York City taxpayers have gotten tired of waiting for both. And so the five boroughs that I represent have reached into their own pockets and paid higher taxes to make the kind of investments that we have to so that we will be 
proud of what we leave our children and grandchildren. In the 1980s, the federal government was spending 6% of its entire domestic budget on infrastructure. Today, that is less than 4%. And as a result, state and local governments are now responsible for three out of every four dollars spent on public infrastructure. To remain the world's economic superpower, we must build the infrastructure to support strong and sustained growth. And that means, very simply, things have got to start changing in Washington. And I hope the year 2009 will be a watershed year. The expiration of the current transportation bill will allow for a new debate on our infrastructure needs. And I would hope and expect that we'll focus on two important issues. One, what should the role of the federal government in our be in our transportation system? And how are we going to pay for everything that we know we need? There are a few principles that I believe should guide the discussion. First, we need to set clear goals both for the short term and long term, and clear metrics for measuring success. Right now, we have no coherent national transportation policy. It's just a grab bag of programs with no goals that correspond to national priorities, such as reducing our dependence on oil or cutting our greenhouse gas emissions. We also lack performance standards to ensure that we can meet our goals, which is just basic accountability. And we lack incentives that encourage cities and states to be more efficient, which is a basic tenet of market economics. These practices are straight from Management 101, and we need to put them to work when it comes to transportation. Secondly, we need to dramatically increase funding. There are now two ways around it. Infrastructure, no, no ways around it. Infrastructure costs money, but polls show that people are willing to pay for it if they know they will benefit. So voters really are smarter than we give them credit for. They know there's no free lunch, but they want to get the infrastructure fixed. And there are lots of things on the table. We need Congress to step up. Third and finally, we need to fund projects based on merit, not on politics. And I think one of the most promising, promising concepts is the one introduced by Senators Dodd and Hagel, a national infrastructure bank. That bank would create an independent, nonpartisan entity that would fund the most vital needs and not the most parochial needs. So uh, this system is broken, but these three principles we think would help. And uh, we're not sitting there just asking for money. We're doing what we can with our own money. Uh, it's just much too big a problem for any one city. The pain has to be spread around the country because the benefits are countrywide. Thank you. Mayor, it was excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> excellent testimony. We thank you very, very much. Uh, Mayor Franklin, thank you for being here. I know Mayor Franklin for some time. We have great mutual friends. And, uh, as well, it's an honor to have you with us uh, this morning. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and to the members of the committee for uh, inviting me to participate, and also thank you to uh, Senators Shambliss and Isaacson for uh, joining us this morning and introducing me. I uh, am pleased to join my colleagues uh, from cities across America to, to come forward and speak on this subject. Uh, in Atlanta, I have a um, self-named um, nickname I'm named the sewer mayor, um, and I chose that name because I wanted to raise the uh, issue of infrastructure to um, the discussion level um, across the city. I named myself in 2003 before the press did. Um, but I am pleased to be here to let you know how important it is that we address the issues that you have studied in previous hearings, but also to address the issues as described by my colleague, uh, Mayor Bloomberg. When I took office as mayor of, of the city of Atlanta in January of 2002, it did not take me very long to realize that the city had severely neglected infrastructure that would require my immediate attention, uh, particularly in rebuilding our water and sewer infrastructure. We are a city of 500,000 people with a water and sewer system that serves over a million people uh, each uh, day. Um, we recently passed the halfway mark of our $4 billion water uh, program, uh, and the details are described in the written testimony that I've presented. Uh, in Atlanta, there is a pressing need for broader and more comprehensive approach to transportation planning and funding focused on more pedestrian and public transit-oriented system. Uh, last year, I was invited to testify before the National's Surface Transportation Policy and Revenue Commission about the City of Atlanta's transportation vision and its relationship with transportation agencies and transit providers in the region. Our transportation infrastructure is critical uh, to the economic well-being, not just of Atlanta and its residents, uh, but especially 
uh, our entire region, which is expected to grow by over 2 million people by the year 2030. Uh, for the city of Atlanta alone, we are expecting a 75 percent increase above our 2005 population um, in 2030. Um, we are certainly uh, interested in this um, fund uh, because, indeed, Atlanta has stepped up to fund water and sewer infrastructure ourselves. Uh, in my second year in office, I raised water and sewer rates nearly 50 percent. Uh, rates are up almost 75 percent now, and I have pending before the City Council yet another rate increase to help pay for water, water and sewer infrastructure. Uh, we believe that we cannot do this alone, uh, not for too long, and in fact we need support uh, from the federal government in terms of matching funds and federal uh, assistance. Um, I announced the Clean Water Atlanta program, a comprehensive long-term program involving a complete overhaul of the city's uh, over 100-year water and sewer infrastructure. Uh, the program includes court-ordered uh, mandates to repair and replace sewer infrastructure and um, voluntary upgrades to our water system. As part of this program, we have drastically reduced sanitary and combined sewer overflows, separated sewers, built more than 120 miles of no new water mains, inspected more than 1,000 miles of sewers, and rehabbed about 250 miles of sewers. Uh, as a result of these efforts, one of our primary waterways, the Chattahoochee River, is cleaner than it was 10 years ago. Although we have secured $500 million in low interest, uh, state loans and approximately six million dollars in grants from the EPA. We have undertaken um, this initiative largely on the backs of the city's residents, some 25 percent of whom live below uh, at or below the poverty level. Uh, Atlanta's customers are already paying some of the highest uh, water and sewer rates and unfortunately we will have to continue to raise rates to fund this program. The condition of our infrastructure has a profound impact not just on the city but on the entire metropolitan region and I believe uh, on the state of Georgia and the southeast region. My testimony contains more detail on the national scope of water and sewer problems but suffice it to say Atlanta's situation is not unique. Uh, local governments are the primary investor in water and wastewater infrastructure in the United States uh, and there have been numerous studies by the U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, that the local share, as has been noted by Mayor Bloomberg, uh, surpasses uh, the federal share and the state share. Uh, so I'd like to move quickly to transportation. Um, this area is one, Atlanta is originally a railroad uh, crossing town, so infrastructure for transportation is very dear to our hearts. Uh, in the metropolitan Atlanta region, uh, we have discovered that the elevated environmental and social uh, economic impact of congestion has a tremendous impact on our future for uh, economic prosperity. Uh, we believe that if we are not able to address this core uh, problem, Atlanta will not be able to continue to be uh, one of the key hubs of economic activity uh, in the United States. Uh, the federal government was very good uh, at matching our funds for the building of our transit system, MARTA, Metropolitan Atlanta Transit System. And we are looking forward to continuing uh, that relationship as we uh, look into the future. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as it is a matter of record that the federal government has reduced its overall commitment to infrastructure, and we are pleased to come today to testify on behalf of this bill that we might be able to apply for federal funds to assist us with transportation, with water and sewer infrastructure, and additionally with um, other types of infrastructure, whether it's roads and bridges, uh, in the city of Atlanta and in American cities. Thank you very much. Mayor, thank you very, very much. <clears throat> Appreciate your testimony. Mayor Payton, we're delighted to have you with us and uh, look forward to your testimony. By the way, any supporting documents and, and material I think the committee would be benefited uh, from, please know that we'll be include them in the record. And, and I'm going to turn, when we complete hearing from our witnesses, to my colleagues for any opening statements they may have. I know time is difficult for some people, so I want to give you a chance to make some opening comments, and then we'll get to some questions if we can, just to give you some idea of how we might proceed. Mayor, welcome. 
Mr. Chairman, thank you for having me and, and ranking member and members of the committee. I want to thank Senator Nelson and Senator Martinez for their kind introduction and appreciate their great representation of our state. I'm honored to be here with this distinguished group of mayors to talk about a critical issue certainly facing our cities and, of course, our country. I serve as mayor of Jacksonville, Florida, which is the most populous city in Florida and the 13th largest city in America, which is a really unknown fact by most. Um, we have a, a population of about 850,000, and as Senator Nelson said, we are a consolidated city-county, which certainly changes our numbers. Jacksonville is a high-growth city and is really at the center of a high-growth metropolitan area. But with the growth comes needs and primarily major capital investment needs. New roads, new sewers must be built while still maintaining older existing infrastructure in the urban core. For example, my growth management task force that I appointed a few years ago analyzed the development and transportation needs in our city, Jacksonville, and predicted that about $2.6 billion is the shortfall in transportation funding alone. Our nation's vital economic centers are metropolitan areas like Jacksonville, Florida, where basic infrastructure is in disrepair or altogether lacking. Like the interstate highway system, the physical assets of these major metropolitan areas yield huge national benefits. Meeting these needs extends well beyond our capacity typically in local government. And other regional and national significance demand a greater and more strategic federal partnership to really move the ball. Jacksonville fortunately has a really long history of being good stewards and, and strong physical management and self-help. We've dedicated, dedicated numerous local resources like uh, uh, they're doing in Atlanta uh, to really invest in infrastructure with local projects with large-scale projects that also have a national influence. We recently passed a half-cent sales tax in Duval County in year 2000 called the Better Jacksonville Plan, which basically was a $2.2 billion infrastructure investment in our community. And most recently, I passed a fee uh, for stormwater, which is a, a dedicated funding source, first of its kind in Jacksonville, for public infrastructure and primarily, wa primarily water improvement uh, for the St. Johns River. However, state action over the past year to reduce local property taxes has resulted in a loss of about $100 million to our local revenue. Now we are struggling to sustain delivery of fundamental city services on a daily basis, let alone find resources to address compelling longer-term infrastructure needs. In my written testimony, I highlighted two specific examples of infrastructure needs that illustrate how appropriate and integral, integral the federal government partnership is to completing these projects. Build out of the transportation network surrounding our expanding marine port terminal and expansion of our sewer system and septic tank phase-out initiative. Jacksonville has the fastest growing deep water port on the east coast of the United States. And as you know, the Panama Canal is widening, scheduled to open 2015. And as that widens, we are now able to receive Asian carriers that otherwise could not economically deliver to the east coast. Jacksonville has become the port of choice, primarily because of our three major interstate, federal interstate systems, I-75, I-10, and I-95, and of course, three rail hubs. We're proud of our port expansion, but quite frankly, the growth of the seaport as a tremendous economic booster um, really is not designed from an infrastructure standpoint to handle this kind of growth. The port generates about $3 billion in economic activity, which increased to $5 billion when the two terminals that we are currently under construction, uh, have currently under construction will be operational. The port system will employ about 100,000 people within the next 10 years, but one terminal expansion will increase the number of trucks on local roads by 250,000 within its first year of operation and 500,000 within three to five years of operation. Our existing local transportation infrastructure simply cannot handle this type of shift in trade from the West Coast to the East Coast as it is today. We will need new roads and rail to divert port traffic away from our local neighborhoods and directly onto our interstate network. The necessary highway improvements with total with total at least $326 million and potential rail yards of a construction estimate of $100 million. Now in Jacksonville, the St. Johns River, which is hosting all of this port expansion, uh, supports more than 19,000 jobs in our community with an annual economic impact of about $2.2 billion. Property along our river accounts for more than $1.3 billion in the county tax rolls. This river is a tremendous asset and that's why we think it's important to invest in it. But the river faces significant problems in notable part to due, due to failing septic tanks, not unlike what uh, they're facing in Atlanta, and of course requires major investment to replace sewers. The city already has provided $80 million and the state has granted about $12 million toward this cause, but it will cost between $400 and $8 million to finish the job. There is no local or state funding source that can quite frankly address this need at this magnitude. 
Florida's Clean Water Revolving Loan Fund is insufficient. And of course, in 2007, the federal allocation of state funds was only $36 million. But most federal grant formulas do not adequately target resources to infrastructure projects on a regional or national level. These systems tend to promote equity distribution among states and then within states between urban and rural areas. We spread these funds so thin that without national strategic direction, there is little impact to the most significant needs. As both a businessman and an elected official, I believe that a more cost-effective approach, like what Mayor Bloomberg is proposing, targets our limited resources around strategies and investments and projects based on merit and projects that will generate the greatest return. The, prim the principles that underlie the proposed National Infrastructure Bank follow, I believe, this framework, dedicating sufficient funding for large-scale projects with true regional or national significance while allowing the formula-based funds to be allocated more appropriately to smaller, localized projects. For our nation's continued economic vitality, and for us it's all about the economy, we need a national funding strategy for activity that yields the highest ROI, return on investment, the term I used when I was in the private sector. We must assure the quality of our infrastructure meets or, meets or exceeds those of the major metropolitan region, regions and countries that we are competing with around the world. I appreciate this opportunity and certainly would be wel welcome to answer any questions at any point. <clears throat> well, Mayor, thank you very much. Very eloquent testimony and <clears throat> I commend you for the job you've done as well. It's very exciting and uh, what, you're, what you're doing in Jacksonville. Those are exciting numbers, mm -hmm. except the 500,000 trucks on the road. I, uh, that's not an exciting number if you're living in North 95 and around New York and Connecticut. Uh, uh, I see Mayor Bloomberg and I rolling our eyes a little bit along with Bob Menendez in New Jersey. Mayor Frankhouse, thank you very much for being here. Chairman Dodd, Ranking Member Shelby, members of the committee, good morning, and thank you for inviting me to testify today on behalf of the City of Kansas City, Missouri. It's an honor and a pleasure to join Mayor Bloomberg, Mayor Franklin, and Mayor Payton on this panel to offer a local perspective on the condition of our nation's infrastructure. I come before you today as the elected representative of the citizens of Kansas City, the largest city in Missouri with more than 445,000 residents. Given today's topic, however, I'd like to expand my jurisdiction, at least for a moment to encompass the entire Kansas City region. As you are likely aware, this wider region spans two states, six counties, and more than 100 municipalities, and is home to nearly two million Americans. In the context of today's hearing, I speak in these broader terms because together we form one economy, and we share much of the infrastructure that is vital to our community's shared health and prosperity. Just the same, however, the health and prosperity of our nation's metro communities are vital to that of the nation. In today's world, metropolitan areas drive the American economy. Consider the following. 83% of Americans live and work in metropolitan areas. 65% live and work in the, in the nation's 100 largest metro areas. 74% of the country's most educated citizens called metro areas home. 84% of our most recent immigrants do as well. And metro areas offer 76% of our knowledge economy jobs. As these figures clearly demonstrate, our nation's metropolitan communities are the incubators of the 21st century American economy and will continue to serve as the arena for American innovation and competitiveness globally. In order to provide a meaningful support to the national economy, then, we must sustain and improve the quality of life in our metro communities and provide a sound foundation on which to continue to produce and innovate. It's a simple fact that cities grow when people want to live in them, and solid, dependable infrastructure is the most fundamental component of cities where folks want to live. Kansas City, in particular, continues its historical role as a vital hub within the nation's commercial and commuter transportation infrastructure. As many of you are certainly aware, the city initiated the nation's first interstate and has long served as the home to the Kansas City Southern Rail Network and a primary junction between three major commercial rail systems. Prior to becoming mayor, I was the city auditor, and my office conducted an annual survey of citizen satisfaction with city services. Year after year, people in Kansas City tell us that they are most concerned with the condition of streets, sidewalks, bridges, sewers, and stormwater drains. Further, when we surveyed business owners in Kansas City, we were told the same thing. Infrastructure is paramount. I continue to hear this as mayor at regular town hall meetings throughout the city. 
every time I hear a complaint about city services, it's grounded in, it has to do with infrastructure. Yet, as municipalities, we are simply unable to meet the infrastructure needs of the region on our own. This is something I devoted a great deal of time studying as auditor, and now I spend a lot more time working on as mayor. Despite ongoing efforts to leverage existing resources, the scale and cost of a regional highway and road system, public transit, water and wastewater systems are more than we can shoulder on an already constrained budget. Even if we pool our resources with other municipalities of our region, as we are trying to do, we won't be able to tackle the daunting challenges we face. The expense is too large, the challenge is too far-reaching to be adequately addressed by local and municipal governments alone. Only the federal government has resources to match the scale of the problems. In Kansas City, for example, we have a $6 billion backlog of deferred maintenance, and our citizens are paying. We are a high tax effort city. Kansas City residents pay as a portion of their income much more than their suburban counterparts and much more than most big cities in taxes, and yet these problems continue to grow. Despite the best efforts of local officials, these and other in infrastructure problems will demand a more robust and assertive federal commitment. Much the same, our city's outdated sewer system allows over six billion gallons of sewage overflow every year into our ribbons, rivers, streams, and urban lakes. These circumstances mean that we're under the gun from the federal government and others locally to improve existing facilities. But the price tag for this little repair job is $2.3 billion. That's a hefty chunk of change for a city with an annual budget of only $1.3 billion, median household income of $37,000, and 23,000 households with annual incomes of $10,000 a year or less. Their sewer rates could quadruple over the next uh, decade. And the cost of construction on these projects is increasing at a rate much faster than our revenues are increasing. This is reason enough to support the National Infrastructure Bank Act of 2007, but I want to support, uh, I want to also express my support for the federal um, partnership that that act represents. The proposed legislation presents a good concept for how to provide long-term funding for large, regionally significant infrastructure projects. In general, the bill represents a commitment on behalf of the federal government to assist metropolitan areas to meet their infrastructure needs and ensure the continued economic vitality and growth of the American economy. On a deeper level, it allows the federal government to make a more realistic assessment of its economy and begin to act strategically to ensure prosperity and global competitiveness far into the future. With this proposed legislation, the federal government can begin to address infrastructure, infrastructure not as a budgetary cost, but as an investment, because it is an investment. Productivity is the result of capital applied to labor. In other words, a man with a spade can't be as productive as a man with a backhoe. In the same way, our cities can't be productive if we don't have infrastructure adequate to meet the demands of a rapidly diversifying and expanding global economy. So long as we fail to invest in these capital resources, we will fall behind other nations in this global economy, nations that do understand the value of quality infrastructure and are making the necessary investments to ensure their competitiveness. I want to close with this thought. Recently, Jack Schenendorf, Vice Chair of the National Surface Transportation and Revenue Study Commission, spoke in Kansas City about the need for progressive funding. He said this, if we don't step up to the plate and come up with a solution, our children and our grandchildren will have a lesser standard of life than they have today. Thank you. Mayor, thank you very, very much, and thank you for your tremendous work in this area. I know you've spent a great deal of time thinking about it in addition to the management of your own city's uh, issues. So we appreciate immensely your thought process and your contribution to this bill effort as well. It's been a tremendous assistance to us. I'd just like to give my colleagues a chance maybe to share a few thoughts on this, knowing time constraints and so forth, and then we get to some very direct questions. Jack, do you have anything you'd like to raise? Mr. Chairman, I just want to welcome the mayors and thank them for their extraordinary leadership. Um, you are truly on the front lines, and we appreciate what you do to deliver services to our constituents. Thank you. Yeah. Senator Dole. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I do have some comments that I would like to make and to, uh, to raise this morning. And I want to thank you and Ranking Member Shelby for bringing us together to focus on this important topic. And certainly my uh, great thanks to our outstanding mayors for your uh, witness this morning, for sharing your experience and your uh, expertise with us. 
There's no question, of course, that our nation's infrastructure is in dire need of maintenance and repair. Deteriorating infrastructure diminishes highway safety and puts a strain on our economy. According to the National Surface Transportation Policy and Revenue Study Commission's report, which was released in January, the Texas Transportation Institute estimates that congestion cost the American economy $78 billion in 2005. The same report estimates that the average driver consumed an additional 26 gallons of fuel during rush hour commuting. As we continue to explore ways to stimulate the economy, funding for transportation infrastructure should be right at the top of the list. We need to take a serious look at how the federal government allocates money for transportation projects before it's time to reauthorize the next highway bill. In North Carolina, there are many high-priority projects that are in need of immediate funding. One of these projects, the Interstate 85 Bridges over the Yadkin River, is located near my hometown of Salisbury. This project's cost is $400 million, and the North Carolina Department of Transportation is exploring funding options. If any federal funds are directed for the bridges under current federal law, the project becomes a federal priority, and the state must finance the balance of the cost. Due to North Carolina's method of distributing transportation dollars, and the expense of the new bridges, this action would wipe out the funding slated for other transportation projects in that area of the state. I understand the rationale of packaging federal dollars with a federal priority. We should, however, consider methods that provide states more flexibility. Another very important project is the proposed North Carolina International Terminal in Brunswick County. This new port would not only be valuable to North Carolina, but also to the nation as a whole. As we've already heard this morning, our West Coast ports continue to operate at close to maximum capacity. Vessels are increasingly being rerouted to access ports along the eastern seaboard. North Carolina's proposed deep water port could give shippers another valuable alternative as projected volumes of international trade double over the next 20 years, not to mention the host of new jobs U.S. jobs that would support this facility. Now, this is incredible to me, what I'm about to tell you. To date, the North Carolina Port Authority has received considerable interest from various private investors for the proposed terminal. The Port Authority is ready to move forward with a $200,000 reconnaissance study. They've been ready. It has the resources necessary to fund this federally required study. Unfortunately, these funds cannot be utilized. Under current law, only federal dollars can be utilized for the Army Corps of Engineers performed study. I'm all too aware of this situation because over the past couple of years, I've made this project a top priority in the appropriations process. But due to continuing resolutions and budget restraints, this project has remained unfunded. In May, I personally met with John Paul Woodley, the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works, to see what the Army Corps of Engineers could do to resolve this situation. Unfortunately, Mr. Woodley told me that without a federal funding commitment specifically designated for this reconnaissance study of $200,000, the Corps is not in a position to move forward on its own. To my utter amazement, what we have here is a potentially multi-billion dollar project of regional and national importance that is being held hostage at the moment by an appropriations process for a relatively small amount of money. In summary, Mr. Chairman, our goal should be to have the best transportation infrastructure in the world. To reach that goal, we must remove the unnecessary hurdles currently in place that prevent projects from being completed in an acceptable length of time. I thank you very much for the opportunity to make these comments. This has been a very frustrating situation for me, and I think we should add this to our consideration of these important topics. Thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Senator Carper? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. To, uh, to our witnesses, welcome. It's, uh, it's good to see each of you. Thanks for coming. Thank you for your stewardship. Uh, and the examples you set, not just for, for other uh, mayors, but uh, one of you is from a city that has as many uh, people as my state of Delaware. So setting some good examples for, uh, for states and, and I think for those of us in, in the federal government, too. I have a statement for the record, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to, to speak off of that uh, statement. And um, I think uh, I was intrigued by this idea. The, the idea of the infrastructure, I think, is one I heard you talk about during the presidential campaign. I'm not sure, but I don't know if that's... talked about a lot of things during that. Yeah, but uh, a lot of good ideas. I think this might have been one, uh, one, one, one of them. But um, 
I, uh, uh, Senator George Voinovich of Ohio and I introduced uh, legislation calling for the, uh, well, let me just back up before I say that. Uh, a number of years, about four years ago, we passed a major, uh, every five or six years, we passed a major transportation bill, uh, as, as you may recall. Uh, we included in that, that, that measure five, four or five years ago the creation of a commission that said, let's look at transportation infrastructure in this country. Let's look at our roads, highways, bridges, and so forth, and, and, and see what our needs are. And we asked for a commission, very good people, to come back and report to us the, uh, what is the scope of the need, uh, give us some sense of what the priority should be, and tell us how you think we should pay for it. And uh, they did that. They looked across the country. They tried to figure out what our needs are um, and different modes of transportation. They came back to us within the last six months and said, this is it, and this is how we think you ought to pay for it. Uh, you heard of the, uh, uh, the term dead on arrival? Uh, unfortunately, they, uh, their recommendations were, were dead on arrival. And they called for, uh, for actually making us pay for stuff that we wanted to have, not just borrow money, uh, not just issue debt, but actually have to pay for things, pay for it out of uh, the, 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 when we go pull up to the gas tank, uh, call for an extra nickel a gallon uh, for, uh, for, uh, for gas uh, taxes, for motor fuel taxes over the, uh, the next uh, 10 years or so. They call for, uh, for looking at other ways to raise fees that we would have to pay for, for the, uh, the, the services that we want to, uh, the, the infrastructure we wanted to build and the services we wanted to, to use. So that happened about over the last four or five years and, and the results that came to us. And I'm sorry to say that not much has happened uh, from, from, from the reference and it's, it's too bad. Last year, the, uh, the month or so before the bridge, we saw the, 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 the bridge in, in Minneapolis that collapsed. About a month or so before that, Senator George Voinovich and I introduced legislation that uh, called for creating a, a different kind of infrastructure commission. We're pretty good about com creating commissions around here. Maybe you are too in, in your, your cities. But we had a little different idea here. What we wanted to do was to create a, an infrastructure commission, not just looking at transportation, but looking at not just looking at roads, highways, bridges, but also to look at, uh, at, at rail, to look at water, wastewater uh, treatment, to, to consider dams and levees, to look across the country to see what our needs are, to come back to us to try to quantify those needs, and to say these will be our priorities, and this is how we'd suggest that you pay for those, not just the transportation piece, but the broader, uh, the broader piece as well. The week that the, uh, the bridge collapsed in, uh, in uh, Minnesota, the bill passed the uh, Senate just like that. The bill went over to the House, was introduced in the House that same week, and it uh, still is awaiting action over in the, uh, over in, in the House. What we suggested was a, a commission, two, uh, eight people in all, two appointed by the majority leader here, one by the minority leader here in the Senate, two appointed by the Speaker, one by the Republican leader in the House, and two, two by the President. You'd have an eight-member commission, and the, uh, the, uh, the eight of them would decide who the chairman would be. They, would, uh, we, they were tasked with spending about the next year and a half to come back and give the new President and the new Congress, uh, a roadmap, if you will, for moving forward on infrastructure. And that's not the same idea as, uh, as Senator Dodd's uh, proposal, but I think uh, much like that safety loop commission, it was a good idea, and I think this is not a, uh, what uh, our chairman has come up with and what uh, Senator Haeckel come up with, also a good idea. And the, at the end, though, we've got to figure out how to pay for this stuff. Nobody wants to. And in my state as an old governor, I know you have, in Delaware, we had a balanced, we had a balanced budget. We want to do things, we had to pay for it. And obviously in your cities, uh, the same is, is, is the case. We've got to figure out how to pay for these things. And that's the, the toughest part of all. Thank you, Senator, very much. Uh, Senator Martinez, any quick comments? Yes, sir, just real quickly. Uh, you know, we, uh, in the state of Florida, high growth state, and Mayor, uh, your eloquent comments, uh, as a high growth state, we also are a donor state when it comes to the Highway Trust Fund. You know, we do not, we send more money to the federal government than we get back. Uh, and that, that's a continuing problem for our state as we have increasing infrastructure needs. But I want to mention, in addition to our transportation needs, we're very obvious and clear. We also have a need in Florida for mass transit. We're making uh, small attempts at that. But in a, it, with the price of gas, what it is today, Floridians really have uh, very few alternatives to just getting in an automobile and driving. Uh, we need to look at mass transit as a future uh, uh, mode. And uh, obviously, our airports continue to grow and expand. And that's a continuing area of concern. One area where I think we really are going to be facing a tremendous challenge in the future is the issue of water. Florida is, uh, is going to have serious water problems. And of course, uh, the wonderful St. Johns River, which flows right through Jacksonville, is going to increasingly become a source that we're going to turn to for, uh, for water. Surface water is much more expensive to treat. And the whole processing of that is going to take uh, Floridians much more to pay for water that they would consume. 
So uh, these are all serious problems. Um, Chairman, I want to tell you and Senator Hagel that I'm very intrigued by your proposal. Uh, I think we need to be looking at creative ways. I think private financing also for infrastructure and public-private partnerships, which has been tried in some places, I think has a lot of merit, particularly in the transportation arena. And I hope that uh, as we look to your proposal that perhaps uh, facilitating public-private partnerships might be part of the issue that we address as well. Thank you very much. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me um, welcome all the mayors, and, and I thank them not only for their testimony of their service. Having been a mayor, I think it's the toughest job in America, uh, and uh, the one where you are on the front lines and everybody, uh, maybe not in some of the bigger cities, but everybody knows how to get a hold of the mayor. Everybody knows who the mayor is, and everybody thinks the mayor can do everything. So uh, uh, having been there for, for six years, uh, I think it's an incredibly challenging job. On the specific issue, Mr. Chairman, you know, we have studies that say we need $1.5 trillion over the next uh, five years just to deal with bringing existing infrastructure uh, up to uh, some of the most significant uh, and important standards we have. That is not about creating new infrastructure. And so it gives you a dimension of, of the challenge. And certainly uh, municipalities, both large and small, don't have the wherewithal uh, to do a, a lot of that. Secondly, uh, at a time of $4 a, a gallon gas, uh, you know, this mass transit that Senator Martinez just talked about and others is incredibly important. You know, in my home state of New Jersey, we've seen a 5% increase in the first three months. Uh, and we already have a pretty robust mass transit operation. But it's not just places like that. In, uh, in North Carolina, in Charlotte, uh, they have a 34% increase uh, in ridership uh, in what is a new rail line. So this is pretty geographically diverse, and as people are consistently challenged with uh, the choices between a gallon in, the, in their tank and a gallon of milk, they're going to be looking to mass transit, but that's got to be uh, effective, efficient, and affordable at the end of the day, as well as it has environment, positive environmental consequences for us uh, uh, as well. And finally, uh, the reason that I've joined with you, Mr. Chairman, uh, in um, in supporting your legislation, you know, I look at this in multi dimensions. Uh, you know, this this the infrastructure investments are that investments, and that's why I appreciate the way the legislation is structured that you and Senator Hagel put together because it it looks at it in the context of investments and makes investment decisions wisely. Uh, the reality is is that you know it, a report in the Atlantic uh, talked about congestions of our roadways. Uh, of our railways, of our ports and airports, costing our economy $78 billion in 2005. That's the last time we had that study. Now, imagine if we unlock the potential uh, of that investment in a way that has a great return on the dollar. Half of those costs were in the nation's 10 largest metropolitan areas, uh, including uh, in the area around my home state of New Jersey. You know, we have, we share with New York the port of uh, New York and New Jersey, uh, the mega port of the East Coast, uh, 225,000 jobs, $25 billion of economic activity. But at a time in which we've closed the military water ports on the East and West Coast, those ports now are also about forward deployment of military equipment for our men and women abroad. So it has a security dimension. And the last point I, I want to make is that at the same time that we, that we look at this in terms of economy, creating jobs, uh, as well as, uh, as uh, the quality of our environment, I would point out that in a post-September 11th world, uh, infrastructure investment and transportation is also about security. On that fateful day on September 11th, uh, the reality is that when the bridges and tunnels uh, were largely closed for that period of time, a large number of uh, New Yorkers and New Jerseyans got out of downtown Manhattan by an alternative method of ferries, which is a relatively new, uh, uh, you know, a decade or so in the, that uh, has started back in the New York, New Jersey area, and we see in many parts of the country. Uh, Intercity travel on that day was only available through Amtrak. And so the reality is, is that in a post-September 11th world, we have to look at infrastructure investments, uh, yes, about the economy, yes, about creating jobs, yes, about improving our collective environment. But I would urge that we look at it also in the context 
of having the security necessary to create alternate, alternative means of transportation, alternative access, uh, and a whole new dimension that we did not think of before. All of these come to roost, and that's why I appreciate the legislation, the testimony of the mayors, and hopefully in the next Congress we can uh, have a Congress that understands that these are investments that the longer we put off, the more it costs, and the more consequential it is to us in all of these spectres. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, Senator, very much. And having the perspective of a number of our colleagues who have been mayors, I think, helps a great deal. And, and our uh, last of our colleagues who's newest in many and, ways and Mr. the committee. Chair, Mr. Chairman, if I very briefly, yeah. I just want to say to Mayor Bloomberg, uh, <laughs> we welcome your mom to come back anytime to uh, have a visit at Dickinson uh, and in the state. Thank you. <laughs> that warmth between New York and New Jersey just is flowing here. Right? Yeah. Senator Corker, former mayor of Chattanooga. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And uh, I just want to say to the witnesses, it's rare that I make opening comments out of respect uh, for the witnesses. I typically want to hear more from you. The, the opening this time has taken so long, I'm afraid I'm going to miss the questioning portion. So let me just say very briefly, uh, I really respect what all of you have done. And I know that each of you are term limited and be moving on to other things. And I sincerely hope, uh, even though we're of various differing parties, that each of you uh, ends up continuing the public arena in some form or fashion, because I think you've provided exemplary service, and I, I really thank you for that. Number two, um, I hope that uh, Mayor Bloomberg at some point laced in to answers to other senators, if I'm not here, that uh, the comment about spreading the pain, if you could maybe educate us as to which types of infrastructure projects, in your opinion, ought to be those where pain is spread and, and the others uh, where just local citizens ought to participate. I think that would be quite uh, edifying. And then to Mayor uh, Franklin, who is my friend, and I think I was the first public official to visit her when she was first uh, sworn in. <clears throat> We've had a really low-level discussion between our states that has also it almost been beneath the dignity of our citizens regarding a water issue. And uh, I know that Mayor Franklin has, has done extraordinary work in building infrastructure and doing those things that are not glamorous to build the city into the future. The state is, is uh, building $100 billion uh, worth of roadways, uh, the state that she's a part of, and yet there is a a no-brainer, easy solution to the water issues that face Atlanta and face the state, and it's a desalination plant down in Savannah running up I-16 I that would benefit the state. I say that, to, and, and fortunately, Mayor Frank, Franklin has not dignified uh, some of this low-level uh, discussion that has taken place, but I hope in your comments someplace, if I'm not here, You'll address specifically that issue, but also uh, just the issue of, of the role that states need to play. I mean, we're having a federal discussion. Uh, there are some planning issues that mayors and states, uh, there, there's a piece there that we, we're not discussing today that is so important, especially around big urban areas uh, where the state is so affected. So uh, those are somewhat questions and not opening comments. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for indulging. I hope I am here when that comes time, but uh, thank you for having this hearing. And I want to say that Senator Martinez, I, Martinez and I were mentioning earlier that we are squandering so many opportunities right now as a country. Uh, we're presiding over a period of time, I think, when we're going to be remembered during this period of time for not doing those things we should have done that generations before us did. And whether this bank is the appropriate uh, focus on infrastructure or whether it's some other solution, I do thank you uh, for having these distinguished witnesses and for you and Chuck Hagel bringing forward this subject in this manner. Well, thank you, Senator, very, very much. And uh, I appreciate the patience of our witnesses as well. But I, my colleagues care deeply about the issue and obviously hear from their own mayors across the country. And I appreciate very much the comments about the proposal that Senator Hagel and I put forward. There's nothing etched in marble or concrete about that. We're just ideas on how you finance and how you prioritize in an intelligent way the major national and regional needs of our country. And financing. I was looking at the numbers of China the other day. They'll, they'll invest on a yearly basis close to a trillion dollars in infrastructure every year. That's their plan. $920 billion a year. I listened to Chuck last year, earlier last year, talking about just what they've done as a major economic competitor in the 21st century. And on roads and mass transit systems, harbors and the like. So uh, aside from what we obviously need to do, the realities are the 21st century. You don't grow economically without making these investments, one way or the other. And draining it out of an appropriation process is not going to work. All of us know that. 
we're going to go from two to three trillion dollars in sovereign wealth funds to maybe 12 to 14 trillion in the next six or seven years. Sovereign wealth funds become a tremendous, I think, opportunity for us to invest some of those dollars or attract them in some of these areas. So I'm, Mayor Bloomberg, why don't you start and pick up on, on Senator Corker's a very good question. The one specific question I had is you made some wonderful suggestions encouraging cities about providing incentives uh, to manage infrastructure issues that I thought were rather worthwhile. And uh, maybe you'd pick up on his, his uh, questions and the one on the incentive idea as well and, and uh, tell us how you think we can contribute to that. If things go between states, clearly a uh, federal issue. doesn't have to be only federal money, but the federal government can justify doing that. If it is to bring commerce to this country, uh, all the major airports, those particularly that deal with uh, tourism and business people from around the world, they're bringing the lifeblood that we need, the, econ the economics and the additions to our culture. Um, if you take a look at energy independence, uh, this country is going in the other direction. So clearly federal money is spent on um, promoting alternative energy sources and the kind of jobs we need for the future. Where I don't think it's appropriate is to protect jobs from industries that the marketplace is saying are not going to be around, holding the waves from coming in, the tides from coming in is just not doable and it's certainly not good economics. I don't think a lot of the small pork barrel things, which we're as guilty as anybody. We ask for money for things that are totally local and why the federal government does it, I don't know. They shouldn't be doing it, although we will continue to ask as long as they're giving it out. There's the, you know, our senators have the obligation to bring home the bacon like everybody else does. But the federal government, it seems to me, the Senate should get together and say, together, we're not going to do it anymore. We'll all swear uh, and the leadership will enforce a focus on sitting back, saying what national priorities are, and then saying, does this particular item fit in? There is the political reality that everybody's got to get something, and I understand that. On the other hand, there are certain projects that have a nationwide impact. And if you take a look, as uh, Senator Dodd said, of what's being done overseas, uh, we really are falling behind. Companies are failing to locate here, partially because of our immigration policies, which are keeping them from bringing their employees in and out. I can just tell you, my company, we are having more and more of our international meetings outside the United States because our employees just don't want to go through customs and immigration here. They just don't want to do it. You should go to Vancouver and see how Silicon Valley companies are all opening offices there for the best and the brightest from around the world that can get working papers in Canada, can't get working papers here. That is, I described it as the case of national suicide, and I think that is an un, that's understating the damage that we are, are doing to ourselves. In terms of uh, Chris's question, there's never any accountability. There's never any, you said you were going to do it for this price, then you've got to deliver it. And uh, you've got to assure us if you don't deliver on schedule and on budget, then you're not going to get any other monies. If you tied the next grant to performance on the last grant, you would get a much different focus on deliverables. And in the private sector, you have to do that. The stockholders or the marketplace makes you do that. And if you don't, there's a very big penalty, including going out of business. One last question before I turn to Senator Shelby. And, and on the rail issues, we talk about mass transit moving people, obviously. I, th there's been an advertisement on television recently, and I, I, I just tell you what it says, and I, no one's contradicted it, but f f you can move one ton of goods 500 miles on rail for the cost of one gallon of gasoline. <laughs> Very efficient. Uh, or something like that, in that, that range. And it, let, let's assume for a second it's true. How, how are we prepared? I mean, Mayor Payton, you were talking about this. Obviously, Atlanta's a hub, rail. Uh, Kansas City has been, of course, historically, and of course, we know about New York. T to what extent do we have the capacity uh, either to expand or to, um, uh, uh, to acquire, if you will, rights of way and so forth to begin to start? First of all, just forget the congestion issues. I mean, that, that number of 500,000 additional trucks on the highway. But the idea of, of just re reducing the kind of congestion and cost, if you can move, if it's close to that number. <laughs> then it seems to me it's in our interest to try and expand the opportunity more of, of utilizing that mode of transportation. Can we do this, or is it totally unrealistic? Have we gone beyond the point, the tipping point, when you can actually take advantage of rights away 
and the like to expand the opportunity of rail for not for necessarily mass transit purposes, but for moving commercial goods. Right. I'll, I'll start, and, and of course I'll let others finish. But uh, as we look at the emergence of our port, we're looking at hosting between eight to ten thousand containers a day, um, and trying to get those containers on the interstate system is, is a big challenge. We think that. The rail solution obviously is not only cheaper from infrastructure investment and wear and tear on the road system, particularly the federal road system, uh, but from an energy perspective as well. So uh, the, the biggest barrier is capital dollars. I mean, we as a, as a city uh, do not have the hundreds of millions of dollars necessary uh, to build the kind of intermodal facility that allows these containers to move to the rail system in an, an expeditious way. Probably our, our, our most hopeful remedy on rail is to divert about 20%. Of the, of the containers on the rail. And I think the, most, the more successful ports probably can boast about a 20% diversion. Um, we, without that capital investment of the rail yards near the terminal, um, it is just a, hard to overcome. So then we have to rely, we fall back on the interstate system. And now the question is, uh, with the three major interstate systems that we benefit from, um, can they handle it? Today they don't have the capacity to handle it, not to mention the road systems around the interstates that allow us to feed into the federal system uh, really are not designed to handle it in, in, in addition. So I think the, the, the challenge is the capital, the huge capital investment. And, and let me just piggyback on what Mayor Bloomberg said. I think the, the challenge is we see a lot of piecemeal work being done. Yep. And, 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 of course, our, 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 our congressional leaders are very proud to bring home something to our community. But in absence of a bigger plan with measurables, with a matrix, um, I don't think we're making a difference. And, and, and is, it, there are certainly a lot of uh, projects that we're glad to see. But I would rather see if a national strategic focus on what is going to move this economy and, and what is into our strategic advantage, uh, and it really needs to be all about the economy. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that, that focus, I think, is really what's desperately needed. Well, that's what we're trying to do with this bill. And again, I, I, there's no pride of authorship and, or the, the funding schemes, but as I say, we're never going to do this out of the normal just, you know, finding a project and getting some funding out of the Appropriation Committee and going through the process. It's got to be a far more creative and expansive idea of attracting capital, private and otherwise, to come into this, where you can offer people some decent rates of return on that investment as a way of generating the kind of resources necessary. And then, of course, as you pointed out and all of you have, this idea of stepping back with a bigger idea here and understanding there needs to be a strategic plan and thinking where you're talking about national projects. None of us have to be informed about how we've grown over the years, whether it was the, the point Mayor Bloomberg made with the federal highway system in the 50s, going back in the 19th century, the canal systems, the Erie Canal systems, the Panama Canal, uh, the electrification of rural America during the Depression. Uh, a lot of these things that just made huge differences, not only at the moment, but of course in terms of economic expansion. I wonder if either, uh, uh, Shirley, do you want to comment on this uh, rail? I, I would just add on the rail that uh, for a city like Atlanta and um, an intermodal approach is, in, is important, both for the movement of passenger as well as um, uh, cargo. Um, our airport does both cargo and passenger. We talk, talk mostly about um, passenger, but our gro a good bit of the growth has been international cargo. Uh, and the relationship of the airport to uh, the Savannah port and the ports along the eastern seaboard. So. Um, while we have capacity today, as, the, as that area continues to grow, we've got to maintain that system uh, and not only expand it, but maintain the rail system. And for me, um, the significance of this bill, in addition to getting funds, is the flexibility that seems to be built into it that allows for um, multiple modal approach. Right. Um, and not just want, not just transportation, but water as related to transportation, stormwater as related to transportation, et cetera, et cetera. And the human side of this, uh, the air traffic control idea, that's not necessarily a building a physical plant, but the idea of capacity through the human infrastructure investment needs that you have to do in order to accommodate growth as well. You know, Mayor, any quick comments? Obviously, mid part of the country and rail is a critical issue. Well, for, for us, we have two major uh, multimodal uh, facilities under construction right now. And we're positioned, I think, to deal well with that. We're, we're taking advantage because we're on I-35 north-south. We have this uh, North American Trade Corridor, and we're actually taking advantage through Kansas City Southern of ports on the coast of Mexico and bringing trains up through. Uh, so for, for us, the the rail thing is, is something we're pretty much, I would say, on top of. But, uh, the, but there are other comments that I, I wanted to, you know, when we look at the bridge collapse in Minnesota, 
several of you have, have sort of touched on this, but what we're witnessing is, in, in addition to that big obvious collapse, we're having a quiet collapse of prosperity. I mean, to, to you know, Mayor Bloomberg's words, national suicide. You know, the, the, when, when Senator Menendez talked about security, there isn't any greater threat to the security of my children and my grandchildren than the decline in productivity that comes from being, what did, what did Senator say, hey, say, last in industrial nations and in investment in infrastructure. This is, this is bizarre. And they're, they're, the main thing, well, obviously we need a lot more money, but the beauty of the bill that, that you have is that we also clearly, obviously, again, as these mayors and you have said, we need a different strategy for investing. We need a different system. Yeah. We don't have, the, 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 the federal government is like the only government I'm aware of that doesn't have a capital budget. Same. Doesn't have a capital budgeting process. Treats everything as if it were an operating expense. Okay. Okay. That doesn't make any sense, and that's yeah, what's okay. contributed to the situation that we find ourselves in. So, so your bill does, you know, the, the the trick of trying to come up with a better way of funding, allocating. I mean, you make reference in the bill to the FDIC. Okay. What I kept thinking of was the Federal Reserve Bank. You know, it's the same kind of a, of a non-politicized system for managing our, 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 our money economy. We need a non-politicized system for managing our infrastructure. Yeah, thanks very, very much. Senator Shelby. Thank you, Senator Dodd. Uh, what kind of infrastructure investments are you currently making? I'll ask the panel this. And how are you paying for these projects, I think? And how heavily do you rely on federal resources and state sources or perhaps private sources? Is it a combination of what, what are you doing, Mayor? Just um, in New York, because the city is so big, mm -hmm. uh, the federal monies tend to be a relatively small percentage. Uh, and we export dollars to the state. I think yeah. uh, um, a senator from Florida talked about how they're doing exporting dollars to the federal government. We complain about that as well. Uh, but New York is the economic engine of New York State, and so we pay for a vast uh, preponderance of our projects ourselves. Uh, we do tend to uh, go to the capital markets. I've argued we should pay as you go, but the reality is if you're going to build a school that's going to last 30 or 40 years, it's not a bad fiscal policy to finance that over 30 or 40 years. In fact, it probably is going to last longer than the debt is outstanding. The danger is that we rush to build things that we really don't need because they're politically popular. We have exactly the same pressures in local government that you have at the federal level, and we're not unmindful of that. Uh, the difference, I think, is that uh, these three mayors, and I hope I do as well, stand up and say, no, we are not going to do that because we're not going to have the money to pay the interest down the road, the debt service, uh, or it is a project that is not as important as other things. The great infrastructure investments that we have to do is our school system. That's right. uh, great infrastructure investments we have to do is uh, water and transportation. Uh, great infrastructure things we have to do is to uh, make sure that we can keep our, seats, uh, our, our streets clean and safe and our cultural institutions growing. Uh, and I thought uh, uh, Senator Frankenhauser said it very well. This is, uh, there's, there's enormous risks in the world. But we always want to go and worry about those rather than the risk that is facing us every day and that is destroying us. This country is throwing away its heritage uh, by not making investments, by not opening its borders, uh, by not addressing the uh, issues of how we're going to pay for medical care and who's going to get it. Uh, understand the political lift. I would suggest if any of you want to close firehouses, uh, put a smoking ban in and raise property taxes, and then do a parade on Staten Island, you can join me. Uh, but uh, today, all of those things are popular. So what do I know? We talk about long-term investments, what we're really talking about. Uh, um, yes. In the, at the airport, um, Senator, um, there are significant federal funds. There are passenger fees. Um, there are the biggest single uh, resource is actually parking fees at our airport. Um, so it's a combination. 
uh, concession fees. It's an enterprise fund, and uh, it has a variety of so sources. So a great deal of your infrastructure is financed privately, isn't it? That in, at the airport, that uh -huh. is true. Uh -huh. uh, and water and sewer, uh, different uh, set of problems, a problem that the city basically ignored for uh, several decades. Um, we do a sales tax, a one-cent sales tax. You ignore at your tax. peril, though, don't you? If you well, you do. You do ignore it at your peril, and in addition to that, you um, pay a lot more for it when you wait 40 years Absolutely. to do it. And that's kind of the point that uh, we're all making about the investment um, at this point. But in that case, 95% uh, of the money is local money, ratepayers, and a sales tax. Six million dollars of two and a half billion came from the federal government. Uh, you know the um, the um, so most of our money is uh, local ratepayers um, for water and sewer for bridges. Um, much some of that money comes from the federal government. Uh, very little of it comes from the city of Atlanta. Uh, but indeed, uh, in the case of bridges, um, unlike roads, where we fund a lot more of it. So it, it's a combination depending on the type of infrastructure. Uh, but the bottom line is the cost is greater than our city can bear long term. And we fool ourselves to think that we can just do water and sewer now, in our case CSOs, combined sewer overflow, sewer separation, and water drinking water upgrades. We haven't even started on stormwater. Uh, that's down the road 2012-2014, which is one of the reasons I was so anxious to come. We need the federal assistance because our rates will be too high to raise then. Um, Mayor Payton, similar? Y yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I think outside of the interstate system and enhancements at our port, you see very little federal money. And, and, that, and I think what we've come, to come to, we've come to the realization that if we want to see uh, improvement in infrastructure, we have to do it locally. And that means uh, passing a half-cent sales tax, which you did in 2000, uh, passing a stormwater fee, which is public infrastructure primarily for leaking and failing septic tanks. It was done last year. Uh, we, we've kind of come to the conclusion that if we're going to improve our city and invest in her, we cannot depend on a reliable source with federal grants or even state grants. And, and the $2.2 .2 billion we raised with our half-cent sales tax went primarily to state and federal roads. Okay. And, and our congestion was so bad, those are the major arteries that were clogged. We could not wait any longer because our quality of life and economy was starting to suffer. So uh, local initiatives are, are funding the bills, I think, really, that should be more federal or state. Mayor, quickly. Uh, the first thing I would say is that, you know, we have not, as a city, while we're spending a lot of money relative to our, our residents' income, we haven't spent it um, as wisely as we should have. We've spent it on operating funds more than capital investment. And one of the things that I ran on in mayor, as mayor, and I've only been in office about a year, is uh, I was very clear to folks, we're going to push money from the operating budget mm -hmm. to the capital budget, and I'm going to be real popular when I do some of the things that, that uh, Mayor Bloomberg was talking about. Uh, you know, I've already had uh, the, the protests at City Hall and so forth about, you know, what, what I want to do. Looking at where we've spent money, we spent a ton of money on our airport recently, and uh, as you pointed out, a lot of that is, is private, and we did get a lot of federal assistance there. Uh, we uh, spent a lot of our own money. Uh, in property taxes primarily, upgrading our schools. We are spending a lot of uh, our money uh, on these intermodal facilities. We spend a lot of money on our streets. Uh, we are going, we're just starting to build a new bridge, the Kit Bond Bridge across the Missouri River. It's a huge project. We are getting a lot of help on that. Um, we, um, I bet we got a lot of help. You got a lot of help with Senator Bond, didn't you? Yes, sir. He's good at that. Yeah, yeah. Is that, is that we're, the same we're very Bond? happy. We're, we're very proud of Senator Bond. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Bond is a, is is a, an icon for us, and we're we're glad to have him. He's good. Um, uh, but overall, our investment in infrastructure, a relatively small amount of it, is federal money. Uh, like uh, Mayor Franklin, I'm about to embark on a major sewer project, and I'm hoping for federal help, but we have no idea what it might be. And then finally, on transit, we're going to do a major transit thing, and we're, we're assuming we're going to get about a 50 percent federal match on that. Uh, quickly, uh, what's the single biggest impediment to the establishment of a public-private partnership for the financing of major infrastructure investments? The single largest impediment. 
Well, I mean, I can tell you mortar and sewer, the biggest, the single impediment was the size of uh -huh. the, the, the need uh -huh. uh, and the lack of revenue. Uh -huh. In other words, we had to create the revenue by raising the rates um, and then passing a sales tax. We could probably get a private sector you had partner. To create the funding stream. To we had to create the funding the stream. Mind. So the, creating the funding stream was the single biggest. My predecessor, in fact, signed the agreements and had much of the planning done for them of uh, the program. The problem was there was no funding mechanism. So I spent about two years putting together a funding formula. And I would say today, five years later, that it is the single hardest thing I've done politically. Um, yesterday, the day before, three weeks ago, when I'm in community meetings, people complain to me about the cost of the infrastructure improvements. Um, someone mentioned that we're term limited, and in some ways that's a good thing because it gives me an opportunity to step way out on a limb to do something that is so unpopular. If I had a federal partner uh, that was funding, and if it was sanctioned, it is sanctioned by EPA, but if I had a federal partner, the, big, the second biggest question I get behind is why are the rates so high is why didn't the federal government help us more? Mayor? Um, if the funding source is a particular thorn on our side, we came up with one called congestion pricing. And in all fairness to the federal government, they did offer us $354 million to pay for all of the equipment to install it, get it going. It would have also generated half a billion dollars in revenue every year. Uh, and our state legislature uh, walked away from it. Uh, so nothing's easy, but I think down the road, that kind of thing, whether it's congestion pricing or tolling bridges or something, we are going to have to have a dedicated funding source that is not authorized by a legislature every year because without that, nobody's going to lend your money long term. You've got to obligate the future taxpayers and future governments to be able to do that. And then you've got to be able to allow the private investors to operate it as a business. If your strategy is going to be we have to protect uh, special interest groups, whether it is people that work there or something else, you, the, nobody's going to make those kinds of investments. They want to be able to deal with the marketplace. It's tough enough doing that if you are constrained by the fact, well, you can't reduce your size of your workforce or you can't pay them competitively with how you can get other employees. You, you may decide you want to do that for a societal point of view but you just are not going to get private money to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Schill, very much. And I, I know Mayor Bloomberg has a plane. I need to catch back to the city. We appreciate very much the time you spent almost two hours with us this morning. So we're very thank grateful you. to Dennis. you. Yeah. Thank you for your, and we'll work with you continually on this and, and ID, and we thank you much, very much for being here. Senator Carper. I, um, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, as, uh, as, as you leave, why did, why did your legislature uh, come out against the uh, congestion uh, uh, pricing approach? I'm going to have to deal with them tomorrow, I guess, so let me phrase it this way. Um, I th Maybe I should ask this question for the record and you could respond in two days. <laughs> the so, one house of the legislature refused to, uh, they set a procedure to look at and craft the legislation, which the agreement we had was if we went through it, it would, they would bring it to a vote and we assume it would pass. We complied with every single thing they asked for. And then I can't answer your question because they never brought it to a vote. Thank you. <laughs> well, one of the uh, I, go ahead. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for, for joining us. And and um, I uh, as a mayor, least I got I got to share with that people a, a wonderful what I think is a wonderful story. There's maybe a little bit of humor here. Uh, Eli, Eli Broad is a fellow who's been very much involved in this country in education reform. Some of you know him. He's from California. And uh, he was, uh, he, he hosted a, uh, really a, sponsored a, an evaluation, sort of a competition, if you will, but amongst uh, large urban school districts. And among the urban school districts that competed uh, was uh, New York City. And within the last 16 months or so, uh, here in Washington, a number of the top urban uh, school districts were invited in. And uh, one of them was recognized for being the best urban school district in the country. And it's ironically probably the toughest urban school district in the country is New York City. And they were honored as the best uh, by uh, the, the, the Broad Found Foundation. 
I'll never forget uh, Mayor Bloomberg uh, spoke and uh, receiving the award on behalf of, of uh, New York City. He talked about how smart the kids were in our schools today, and he, he recalled that what his job in school, he said, my job in school is to make it possible for, for, other, st uh, for other kids to be in the top half of the class. <laughs> I just thought that was one of the most uh, self-deprecating, uh, funny, funny things I'd, I'd heard a mayor or somebody of, of that stature say. I always, I've quoted him many, many times, and I, it's just refreshing to hear him then and, and the, today, and to hear all of all of you. At, at, uh, I, I, I describe myself sometimes as a recovering governor, and uh, I, uh, I, I yearn for the days when. And actually get stuff done, and I just applaud each of you for for having the courage to uh, to, to work hard and to take on some uh, some uh, some tough uh, tough jobs and to get, to get things done. We I want to go back to the safety loop. That's the major transportation bill we passed about four years ago, and uh, I, I said earlier that we created a, a, a an in infrastructure commission. And we said to them, go out and look at our transportation needs across the country, figure out how we, what we ought to do and how we ought to pay for it. And one of the things they came back with was a nickel increase in the gas tax over about nine, ten years. So it would be about a half dollar over that period of, of, of time. They also suggested that we uh, consider privatizing some of our roadways, allowing private companies to come in and uh, buy them and uh, presumably toll those roads and improve them accordingly. They, ca they called for um, additional tolling of roads. They called for uh, congestion. Uh, uh, charging people more money for, for greater congestion. Uh, what of those ideas, uh, uh, do, do any of those register with you? I don't want to put, put you on record as favoring a nickel increase in, in the gas tax. Uh, well, I'll would, go on record. Yeah. Um, the, Georgia has one of the lowest uh, gas taxes. And um, really, to tie this to an earlier question, which is how do you, how do you, um, I mean, one of one of the problems that we have in Atlanta in the metro area is that we too had a gas tax, a, a, a transportation tax that couldn't make it out of our general assembly. If in fact we this were an incentive, this uh, bank uh, had incentive funds, we might have been able to get the three votes that we missed um, in getting that out because there would have been some incentive uh, from the federal government. So, I mean, there's no question that a gas tax. Um, our governor recently um, uh, waived the, gas, the state gas tax uh, during the summer, which in my opinion is going in the opposite direction. I concur. Um, so we, we do have a, a whole series of problems in relating to our General Assembly around these very issues of funding infrastructure. But gas tax is one we certainly, I would certainly support uh, in Georgia. All right, thank you. Any, any other thoughts on, you know, on I think, these um, transportation needs? Uh, the tolling, I, I think, it can be a viable source. We're working on an outer beltway in our county um, that will be supported primarily by tolls, and, and I think it's it's probably the ideal user fee. Um, the notion of a gas tax in this environment, I think, would be a very, very tough sell. Um, I, I wouldn't want to advocate it, but um, certainly uh, if we can find ways to capture costs of those that are using the, the roads primarily, that you, it's, it's viable. So it's interesting. The technology, I think, has made tolling a lot more attractive. One of the big, biggest barriers to it was the congestion it would create. But now you see around Orlando and others that have really done a lot of tolling, they can even drive through nearly at the speed limit and, and be uh, registered. So um, I would think that is a viable alternative. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Mayor, Mayor Funkhauser, let me just okay. say, Mayor, before you answer, I love your name. <laughs> I, just, I can just imagine big billboards <laughs> in Kansas City, Funkhauser, mayor. I mean, that's a great name. <laughs> Reminds me of 1970s funk group or something, you know, parliament or whatever. <laughs> it's great. We capitalized a lot on I bet you have had a great I, I never time thought with my name would be an asset or my size or the way I looked, but all of it was in the campaign. Uh, but yeah, the, can, can uh, any sh campaign slogans you want to share with us? It might just for oh, as yeah, an aside yeah. here. Google it sometime. You'll, you'll right. find more than enough. Um, with, with regard to the, the proposals that you mentioned, you know, uh, we obviously need to do all those things. I mean, we obviously need to do significant gas tax increases. And the folks who think that uh, you know that's um, not very smart, uh, we well, just wait two weeks and you get the equivalent at the pump that you're paying anyhow. Uh, but it's going to some uh, foreign company, some foreign government, or to, to, to one of the major companies here. Uh, let me just interrupt for just for a second. This, uh, this uh, commission, uh, the Safety Loop Commission, recommended a nickel increase in the gas tax over nine or ten years, 50 cents in all, I think. And the, gas, the price of gasoline has gone up that much, I think, this year. Oh, e easily. I mean, I, I read most of that report Did you know, okay. that, yeah, the, that they put out, and I thought, it, you know, it's, it's again, you know, the question is what is politically practical, 
I don't know. I'm not a very good politician. Uh, what well, you must be pretty sense? good. <laughs> what makes sense? the right name. Yeah. Rational thought, rational action. We have to do what makes and, and most citizens can You can sit down and explain this. I, I talk to citizens at these town hall meetings once or twice a month and just stand there and take questions and talk to them about this sort of stuff. And, and they get it. it they, they understand it's an investment and it's pay me now or pay me later. I mean, I, you know, we're trying to get a, 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 a half cent sales tax increase as a region to support transit. And if you do the math for, for one of the families in our wealthier communities, that would cost them about $250 a year. If they reduce, if, if they get two or three cars and they take one of those cars and they drive it 10% less, they save more than that 250 bucks. You know, so if, you, if you're a family with a husband and wife and a couple of teenagers and, and one of the teenagers can take the bus or the train to school instead of driving, you've saved more than you're going to pay in the tax. I mean, it's, the, the math works and citizens get it. Yeah. We've got one son that goes to school up in Boston and uh, he doesn't use a car. He used to use the transit, uses transit going back and forth, the train and so forth. Mr. Chairman, you, you, you asked earlier, you said, I think it's, uh, I'm not sure on these numbers, but you said, I, I think I've heard that and moving, moving a ton of freight by, uh, by rail. Uh, miles. It's about 500 miles. We had, we had a, a, a hearing before the Commerce Committee this week, and the uh, guy was there from the American Association of Railroads. In his testimony, he said it's 436. But, uh, 36 miles. But if, but, Apologize. Well, no, 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 no. That's close enough. <laughs> but uh, if you actually think about it, that's, that's basically t moving a, t a, front, a ton of freight by rail from Washington, D.C. to Boston on one gallon of diesel fuel. Boston, one gallon, yes. Yeah. The, uh, I've been riding the train this uh, this week, not just b between Wilmington and, and, uh, and D.C., but also from uh, Wilmington to Philadelphia, Philadelphia to New York, and New York back to uh, to, uh, to Wilmington. I noticed uh, even in midday trains, trains were full. Yeah. In a couple of cases, like standing room only. The uh, House yesterday passed uh, their uh, their Amtrak reauthorization bill, which calls for creating similar to what Frank Lautenberg and Trent Lott and I and others have, have proposed here as passed the Senate. But they've put, proposed that... Uh, that we we use the federal government as a little bit of a different partner in uh, in inner city rail uh, support, and try to do it in a way that involves uh, the states to, invites the states to participate and freight railroads. Yeah. You know, when you're out of the northeast corridor, the folks that it's it's not an, uh, Amtrak's track anymore. They're they're on the freight railroad tracks. But if you uh, when I was governor, we wanted to do a highway project. It was 80-20, 80 percent federal, 20 percent local. If it was a transit project, it was 50 percent uh, local, you know, 50 percent uh, federal. If I wanted to do an inner city uh, rail uh, project in my state that made more sense than either of those, it was uh, 100 percent local, zero federal. And uh, what we proposed to do was to change that in, in our legislation. And, and that's, I think, something kind of works with with what uh, what you and, and Senator Haeckel are working on uh, too. Well, thank you very much. Uh, again, our thanks to all of you for for being here for, for your jobs. I just have a couple of quick questions for you. One, I want to pick up the point Mayor Funkhauser you talked about. I, I, I read David McCullough's biography of Harry Truman. Who, was he state auditor or was he, he was state? Uh... He was the uh, county judge, which is basically the chief executive of the county. Well, was that when he went back? I love the chapter when he goes out because there were a lot of dirt roads in his day. Yeah. And he went out and sold the idea of paving the roads. But he went out from community to community, day after day, day after day, making the case to people in clear, rational terms about why it would benefit the community for doing that. And they, of course, bought into it. We made the point. It's labor-intensive work, that this stuff. You've got to just put the time and effort in. So there's a wonderful examples in Missouri politics of exactly what you're Plain what you're speaking. Doing. Plain speaking. I wanted to pick up, I've got a number of members here come from rural states. And, and, and I think there's a, a danger that people see this as an urban issue. And obviously, there's a lot of attention on the urban issues that we can contract over. John Tester from Montana, for instance, and... Uh, I was curious. I wonder if you might just comment, if you could. I know you're giving some thought in, in terms of how this this benefits. It isn't just the areas we're talking about. We're talking about national projects and regional projects. And for the record, what what, what this could mean to a broader constituency beyond those immediately affected by this, as you might point out. Well, you know, goods are going to you know, a lot, uh, rural folks buy goods the same as everybody else. And a lot of those goods are going to come from overseas, and they're going to come through these ports, and they're going to come on the trucks, and they're going to come on the uh, railways, and they're going to cost more, they're going to take longer, they're going to be more difficult to get in. And that's going to cost rural folks just like everybody else. At the same time, rural folks are, you know, they're, they're, many of them are farmers or, or, or miners, and their goods, you know, with this uh, timber, what supports their economy has to be shipped out. And they're going to have difficulty doing that. I mean, 
that's there there isn't any connection any any question that we're all interconnected everybody is dependent on everybody else in the united states all this stuff vitally affects all of us yeah. mayor payton any comment on that yeah well look, i'll just give you the example that we have um our port is growing um because there's a major shift in goods from the west coast to the east coast due primarily to congestion on the west coast and a perception that there's a labor unfriendly environment so so with the widening of the Panama Canal, these goods are coming to Jacksonville because we have three interstates to reach these exact areas that we're describing, uh, I-75, I-95, I-10. Uh, we are actually west, the most western city on the East Coast, so we're easier to get to the Midwest uh, through the interstate network. So I would say um, this shift is an economics shift that is allowing a, a, a lower cost providing uh, company to bring goods to these areas uh, more efficiently, more effectively. Yeah. Surely any point on that, because yeah, Georgia, a lot of rural areas in Georgia. And well, ag agriculture is a big uh, industry right. in Georgia, right. so the movement of goods, um, I think, is an important one. Certainly the movement of, uh, as has been uh, described, from uh, foreign ports or other ports into, into and out of our airport and our, and our port. But I would, I would also say that um, the, the, the issues of climate uh, and climate change um, affect everyone. Yeah. So to the extent that you have heavier concentrations of carbon emissions um, in a city like Atlanta that, that is not on the coast, um, where we don't get the winds that my uh, colleague might get, the bottom line is that pollution goes out beyond the city of Atlanta and in, in effects. Um, so if we are creating more and more um, air pollution, um, that's a problem. If we are creating water pollution, our river, the river that, w that serves Atlanta for drinking water purposes and that we use for wastewater purposes as well, flows up and down um, uh, the state of Georgia on the Alabama border. Yeah. So what we do, what happens in the river, really affects Alabama, Georgia, rural and urban. So those would be two examples. They're very, very good. Listen, you've been great, your patience here in all of this. I'm going to leave the record open for a few days because I think members may have some additional questions. I was speaking with Ch Senator Hagel as he was leaving, and, and uh, I need to obviously talk with Senator Shelby about this, but my intention would be to try to mark this bill up uh, in July. Uh, We've got the housing issues to move along, and I can't predict what's going to happen. Obviously, we've got only a few weeks left around here, but, but I think the fact that we've had a diversity of political opinion at this table, as we have when we've had other hearings, and I think you've heard just around the table here, this is an issue that transcends any of that, and, uh, and I've got the benefit of having a number of colleagues on this committee who've been mayors. <laughs> There's no, no greater advantage uh, since you come at the end of the food chain, as we all know in the game of of national politics. So my intention would be to try and move this bill uh, along. I know there are a number of uh, similar proposals. My, my uh, former chief of staff, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro, the congresswoman from New Haven has got a very good proposal in the House on infrastructure, as do several other members. Jim Overstar, the chairman of the uh, Transportation Committee over there, has some decent ideas as well. So we're going to try and incorporate some of these. But we need, as you pointed out, strategic national thinking on this question. This is not a time for small bore politics uh, here, where the continuation of an existing system where we fund a little projects around the country, uh, some of which I don't underestimate are important, but in terms of having a national strategy to get us back on our feet again, is never going to happen unless we do this. <laughs> Education and this, energy policy and health care, the four issues that I identify as a way you can start to get this country moving in the right direction. And we can start by doing it quickly, in my view. So I thank you immensely. I can't begin to tell you how valuable it is to have you here. Um, it's wonderful to have the technical people. We had a great hearing with technical people who came, and they're invaluable in giving us their data and assessment about how this works. But to have mayors who, who deal with this every single day and wrestle with these tough political choices uh, just adds tremendously to the quality of the debate and discussion. So I'm deeply appreciative of the time that, that you've taken to be here to share your thoughts, and we'll stay in touch with you. And additional thoughts and ideas, we welcome this committee. So I thank you all very, very much. The committee will stand adjourned.